why will comfort ruin your life? Because growth only occurs in a state of discomfort. Welcome to the Spartan Up Podcast, hosted by Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race, and brought to you by Wild Health. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up Podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Get race ready with Wild Health, the official healthcare provider of Spartan. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Titan Fitness, the official partner of Spartan North America. From sandbags to power racks, we provide the equipment you need to prepare for the race of a lifetime. Visit titanfitness.com. Okay, from my apartment in Florida during the hurricane, Joe DeSena, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast. I got a good one for you today. A gentleman that wrote a great book that I love, The Coaching Effect, Bill Ekstrom. He, um, he owns a bunch of companies, and just like all our companies start with the word Spartan, all his companies start with the word Excel. I love it. Bill, where are you right now? Well, uh, in a better spot than you, Joe. Um, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, but I'm thinking about you because uh, we – uh, spend a lot of time in Naples, and so we have a place there. And we're w- waiting and wondering. We're waiting for phone calls to say, "Hey, do we have water in the house? Do we, you know?" Um, so I'm stuck here in Lincoln, unable to go down and join you. Yeah, I I, um, I flew into the hurricane. Actually, I, I wanted to get back with my family. I was out in uh, L.A. and um, I made it in just in time for the hurricane to hit. And um, winds are winds are pretty strong. Where are you, Joe? I'm in Orlando. Ton, tons and tons of water. Okay. Um, my kids want to go kayaking down the streets. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's a little little wild here. But um, we came here, interestingly enough, because of a, a coaching program. And it's, um, it's a world-class wrestling program for boys. So our two boys are doing that. Our girls are doing soccer. And this coach came from nowhere. And he built the program in 15 years to be one of the best in the country, if not the world. Um, so I'd be, I mean, I, I think I know why it's so great. I mean, he rules with an iron fist. Um, he wants the kids to be, you know, the best they can be. Um, but, but in your research and in your book, The Coaching Effect, what, what do you find are the key reasons uh, for success? Uh, Joe, we could spend a long time on that, um, answering that question. The never, as you know, Joe, there's never a single thing. There, there's a variety of things, but, uh, when we study, uh, what great leaders, what great coaches in the world of sports are doing, what's foundational to all of them are several things. Number one is a create trust-based connections with the people. They create psychologically safe environments. And while there's six items that we believe create what I'll refer to as the best experience, the third being their ability to challenge in a healthy way. So the, there's nothing wrong with, um, I'll use your term, ruling with an iron fist. As long as uh, people buy into the uh, that culture, as people, if the person ruling with iron fist still shows that he cares about them as people, not just athletes, uh, that matters, and that's what we're saying. I could I could continue on, but those areas, the, the connect, trust-based connections, psychologically safe environments, your ability to effectively challenge in a healthy way, are what we see as the three coaching traits that have the strongest correlation to producing discretionary effort and providing the best experience for student-athletes. Hmm. And, and um, you know, Marion and I, Marion, who's behind the scenes doing the podcast, we were fortunate enough to go to West Point and meet with the West Point wrestling coach, um, I don't know, a couple of summers ago. 
And Kevin Ward said something interesting. He said, you know, Joe, um, a room, in his case, a wrestling room, will fall to the level that I allow it to. In other words, whatever, whatever I allow in here, we're going to fall to that level as opposed to rising to my expectations. So if I let some, some jerk in here or bad attitude or whatever it may be, like everybody goes down to that level. Do we, do we believe that? Uh, I do. And, and I'll, I'll also put it this way. Um, while it will go down to that level, and the reason it will is because coaches are also mids to performance. Uh, coaches either propel or inhibit growth. It's that simple. And, and too often, coaches, by allowing that end to your to to the point you made, yes, that means we're lowering the lid by raising the lid. And coaches are accountable for doing this. If they want their teams to grow, if they want their teams to get better, that means coaches need to get better. The coaches need to continually evolve as well. And if I, if, and the same applies in the world of business. If I want my team at Excel Sports or Excel Business to grow, I have to get better as leader. When I raise my lid, they raise with me. So yes, it can, it can be down at the bottom, it can be at the top, but it all rises and falls to the level of the coaching. And what, the, and what they allow, right? I mean, I, by the way, I would imagine it's not just coaching kids, it's any high performing team. It's, it's a coach, leader, manager, right? All the same thing. It, 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 it does, you know, when we, looked at data across business and athletics and education, I would tell you probably 90% of the behaviors are the same that make for successful um, growth and experience for students in a classroom, um, uh, on a football field or volleyball court, and in a boardroom. It, those behaviors really cut across. We The power of connection and creating psychological safety is just as important in business as it is in the classroom as it is you know, in a gym. So those things cut across them all. You're right. They need to trust you. You've got to provide a safe environment. And then you got to motivate the hell out of them, I guess. Yeah. You know, we, we look at it as, you know, there, there are others, you know, we look at structure to your point about ruling with an iron fist. Structure is a big one. It's another thing that's quantifiable, measurable their ability to develop their skills and their ability to communicate. So there are what we call six coaching behavioral themes that we measure. And all those, uh, every one of them comes into play. Some just have a stronger correlation to, uh, to either the experience, depending on what you're measuring, you know, at, at the high school and college level, we'll measure student athlete experience at the professional level, the really high levels, you know, it's probably similar to your kids. My daughter uh, moved when she was in high school down to South Florida to a, a tennis academy. They're not messing around down there. You sign up for a different experience. You sign up for a different level of intensity. It, it you know it's all it's a different ball game when you're training professionally for something, and it and it goes from three to four hours a day of work to eight hours a day of work. So the same things apply. It's just amped up. Yeah. I, um, I wonder though, uh, it's too bad, right? All these physical education programs are going away or have gone away. And, um, and then the remaining programs that you have, you probably don't have, um, all the best coaching because it's, it's, it's an afterthought in so many schools is that what you found in your research yeah it, well what's interesting is um and we don't have any research on this but just talking for example with athletic directors um uh specifically the high school level you know if you get a large football program and doesn't matter school in the midwest kansas nebraska wherever a large class football program they used to, uh, I had one tell me the other day, he goes, we, we'd have 25, 30, 40 applicants for that position. Now we get three to four. And a lot of times we have to go recruit coaches to take over teams. So 
Um, and then you get to smaller schools, man, they, they just struggle to find coaches, period. Clubs are struggling to find coaches. So it, it's a whole, it, it is a different atmosphere out there now. And why that is, we could debate, but it is. It's too bad, right? Because in so many instances with yeah. young kids, uh, I know myself as a parent, the coach plays such an important role for the whole family. And, it, and if, like you said, and like your research shows, if you get the right one, it really helps the kid blossom. Um, you get the wrong one, maybe maybe you're going backwards as a kid. So it is it is mm-hmm. a shame. Um, how, how, how could you change things? Like, I, I always try to think big picture. My goal is to change, you know, 100 million lives. What, what would you do? You're president tomorrow, Bill. What would you do? <laughs> president of the United States or president of coaching? <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, there, there, there's so many things we could do, right? Uh, number one, I, I think it's important to quantify uh, you know, I'm going to narrow it down to coaching again. I think it's important to quantify uh, people's effectiveness in the role. Uh, we, we see there is a significant disparity between how coaches think they coach and how their coaching is perceived or taken or received by athletes. And it's hard to get better as a coach if I don't know, if, if, if you're my coach, Joe, and if you don't know, you may think that, hey, we're trusted, we've got this connection, you know, um, that's in place because without that, you don't know much about me without that. If you go to challenge me or push me, I might push back, you know? Um, and then you learn that only 50% of your athletes believe they have a connection with you. Now, all of a sudden everything changes. So I, I think quantifying, giving people the opportunity to have data on their effectiveness is critical because all learning begins with what all growth begins with learning something new. Um, and, and coaches have to quit hoping they're effective and they need to quantify their effectiveness. I would imagine most coaches, most schools, most programs, they're measuring success simply on the scoreboard, but you're saying that's not enough. It's not. So we did a series of focus groups with coaches. um, And I'm focused on the high school level here for a minute and athletic directors. Uh, So we have data on this. They unequivocally also coaches and AD said their number one priority is to create the best possible experience for their student athletes. And that winning was way down here. Even coaches said, yeah, winning's not as important because coaches really believe that if I provide that best experience, the result is winning. So then when we followed that up and said, okay, great. So that's your number one priority. Tell me if that's happening. Nobody could answer that. All they could say is, yeah, we hope it is, but we don't know. Um, At the collegiate level, you hear athletic directors all the time talk about, you know, the, the experience of their student athletes, the experience of this, the experience of that. Um, but until we begin to measure it and report on it and improve on it, it just becomes nice language, something cool to talk about. Achilles tendon injuries are really common, but did you know there's a lot you can do to prevent them? Hi, I'm Dr. Julie Fouché from Wild Health and I myself suffered from an Achilles tendon rupture several years ago. Later to find out, there was a lot more I could have done to prevent this injury. So the first step is recognizing the first sign of any Achilles tendon pain. This could be pain in your Achilles tendon, it could be in your calf or in your bottom of your foot. When you notice this, you probably wanna take a step back from training and rest that area. Then you wanna reintroduce training through weighted eccentric exercises. So this means grabbing a backpack, holding a dumbbell or a kettlebell, and using both feet to raise up onto your toes. Then slowly lower down using only one foot. 
repeat this 10 to 12 reps on each side for about three sets. Then you might wanna work with a trainer or a physical therapist to identify any biomechanical issues that could be leading to your Achilles tendon pain and make sure those are addressed. There are also some antibiotics that can increase your risk of Achilles tendon rupture. So if you need to be on an antibiotic for any reason, try to avoid the fluoroquinolone class of antibiotics. And finally, there are some increased genetic risk for Achilles tendon rupture. So if you fall in this category, you wanna pay extra attention at the first sign of any Achilles tendon pain. So hopefully this helps you avoid having an Achilles tendon rupture like I had. Our official partner of Spartan North America, Titan Fitness, offers free shipping on all your fitness products, from battle ropes to power racks to sandbags to dumbbells, no matter how heavy they are. Their customers come from all walks of life. From elite athletes to weekend warriors, they have you covered. Whether you're training in a commercial gym, home gym, or in the great outdoors, their fitness products help prepare you for the race of your life with the best equipment designed for athletes. Visit TitanFitness.com to enhance your life today. Well, is, is there hope? I mean, you, you, you dove in and rolled up your sleeves and did this research. Is there hope? Um, or, or is it just, you know, one of those jobs that, like, people don't really get credit for? They don't get paid that much? Like, certainly the NFL is different than, than all right. these... Um, Right. So, yeah. yeah. What, what do we do? Uh, the, the, I do believe there is hope. Um, what's interesting. So we could go a lot of different ways from this. Um, number, you know, coaches sans power five schools, sans professional coaches aren't in it for the money. Right. And so you eliminate the top 2%. You got 98% of coaches that are doing it for the love of the sport, the love of the kids. Wouldn't you agree with that? I would agree with that. And, and um, it's easier when your own kid is in the program. And I'm always amazed at coaches that don't have any kids in the program. And you could just see they love it. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, and so I think the love is still there. Now, then we, what we need to analyze is why aren't more doing it? And, and, if you, and I don't have any data, data on this. I'll give you my opinion, which is dangerous, Joe. <laughs> But if you talk to enough athletic directors and coaches, they would tell you it's the parents. That they are the they are what drives coaches away from coaching. Mm. Mm. I am um, I'm on a parents group of crazy dads um, from this wrestling program I just told you about, and um, I could easily see that now that I know the coach pretty well, the high performing iron fisted coach. And I know the parents, including myself, um, I could definitely see that. And then I reflect back. I lived in Canada for a year and I happened to, I, I was getting our children into hockey. And I had the opportunity to talk to this hockey coach who also happened to work with the country of Sweden, who was attempting to, to make hockey in Sweden better and was study, studying the Canadians. And he said, after a full year of research and a really thick book, it came down to a few sentences to make Swedish hockey better. And I said, what was that? And he said, get the parents out of the rink. And when they got the parents out of the rink, they, 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 they turned the heat off. They got rid of all the seats. As parents, we are the problem. Well, I, I, I can't say parents are the whole problem, but they are certainly contributors. Uh, they, they, you know, I, I had a conversation all along ago, a very successful high school volleyball coach who, uh, and I asked why he left. He goes, you know, he said, I sat there in the, you know, in a room about a month ago and for 45 minutes, just listened to parents berate me. And he said, got done with the meeting. I kept my cool, went out the next day, won the district championship, you know, uh, got beat at state tournament. He said, but I walked away. He goes, I, it's just too much. I, I, it's just, you know, ridiculous. Now, why do parents behave that way? I, there's a lot of different, uh, I, I don't know, a lot, but several, a lot of people think because um, they're investing more. You know, what's it take to put your kids in that program? What's it take to put uh, a, a young woman in club volleyball or a young man in club soccer? or a young woman in a tennis academy. Those aren't inexpensive investments. And 
when parents are putting that much in, they want a voice. They want to say, you know, did your dad say much to coaches when you were a kid playing? No, you know, I think about it as you're talking and I'm thinking, you know, back then my dad was so focused on work, right? On his stuff that he wasn't real. And I think probably back to the 1940s, 1950s, 60s, like <clears throat> that was probably the case. Now parents have more time on their hands and they're tinkering and they're, and, and, and we're involved. Right. And you know, this coach at this wrestling program here, coach iron fist, he, um, he has two metal gates, two metal gates mm -hmm. to keep the parents that far away from the actual program. I of course go in the metal gate, which I'm not supposed to, and I and I work out because I want to get a workout in. But I could see why, um, why he wants to keep the parents away for all the reasons we're we're, we're talking about. It just makes the pro. It's hard enough to like motivate all these kids and put a program together and make sure folks are paying with their like. That's hard enough, and then layer on top of it, listening to 80 parents. Oh my god. Oh yeah, if, if it, it would. It's, it's, it's challenging. It really is. And here's the deal. And we were talking about this the other way, our executive team. Parents aren't going away. They're not going away. As a matter of fact, we did some, uh, uh, an organization has hired us to do some research of parents, which we were a little gun shy of doing, but we're going to do it. And we started, and our director of research started doing some early research. And she, she was asking parents, hey, what's most important to you? When you think about your kid in sports at the high school level, what is most important to you? And I wish I had it at my fingertips. But um, top three were things like the coach gives my kid self-confidence. Uh, the coach makes my team or makes my kid feel included. The coach, and there, there's one other, uh, it, uh, provides a great experience for my, for my son or daughter, right? Guess where playing time was on the top 10? Number 10. Uh. It was all the way at the bottom. So are those though, is it, is it like the media that we consume? Meaning that uh, we're gonna hear about all the flooding and you know, you, you get the film of the Naples Fire Department walking in four or five feet of water, you know, trying to rescue people. Um, are those the exceptions? What about the 98% of the homes that didn't get wet or didn't get flooded or didn't have damage, you know? Or is that what we're seeing with parents? Because when we're researching them, parents want the same thing for their kids that athletic director, directors and coaches want for their kids. Coaches now have to focus on, am I doing that? Am I, am I providing that? You know what, you know, Coach? It's easy words to say that, hey, this is more important than winning, but how come we only talk about winning at practice? Why wouldn't we Why wouldn't we take that list that you just put forth, right, and, and have the coaches make the parents and kids sign it so that we're fully committed? You like that? Yeah, that's a great idea, Joe. As a matter of fact, I may steal that from you and, and see some, some of our, our, our schools that we work with want to do that. And then I'll tell you the results and I'll give you credit. <laughs> That's awesome because um, I'm just thinking about it here for the club. Um, because I think, I think parents, we go off script during a tournament on the weekend, even though we said all the right things you just described. We definitely go off script. Keep going. And, and we, we start uh, worrying and uh, being upset and complaining about what happened in the tournament, and why we didn't win, and what this happened and that happened. And, and wait a minute, you signed this piece of paper. <laughs> Winning wasn't the most important. Playtime wasn't the most important. Right, right? and now you're, now you're going ballistic over it, right? Yep. So I, I pulled the research up while you were talking there. So what was most important to parents? Number one, and this, there's a tie for the top two, that being a good role model for my student athlete was tied with caring about my student athlete as a person. Those are the top two items. Closely behind that were two more. That uh, the third is building my student athlete's confidence and then telling my student athlete when they do a good job. 
So those are the top four. The bottom two, the last one is winning, and the next one up is giving my student athletes playing time. Mm. There are um, there are twelve items ranked, and let me see four or five. Yeah, twelve items ranked, and I gave you the top four and the bottom two. Now, isn't that interesting, though? Yeah, I think you're getting I think you're getting bad information from us parents. I think. And the reason I say that is um, I was also told, you'll correct me if you know this or not, that the thing that children hate most about sports across every country everywhere is the ride home with their mom and dad or mom or dad, because that's where they're getting berated or discussed, to, you know. And, and so if that's true, which I assume that research is true and accurate, then um, something, something doesn't match. What we're telling, right, what we're filling out the survey and saying, based on what you just described, does not match the ride home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, the, the last piece I've heard, I think, I can't say, Joe, whether that, that, that's true or not. Um, I think probably a lot of parents have their moments. Um, you know, what was, what was the movie, Sir Richard? Or Venus and Serena Williams' dad, you know, he refused to put his daughter in daughters in, in junior tennis because of the parents. <laughs> Did, didn't want them exposed to that. I, I've seen that. I've been one of them. Um, yeah, it, I think there's always there will always be some conflicting behaviors. What in other words, what I like and what the, what I like the way I like to behave, the way I like my kids that what what I like them to have. And the way they behave can be two separate things, but it doesn't mean that's not what they want. Well, you're awesome. How do people find out about the book? Where do they get it? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, the book is Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all your legitimate bookstore outlets should be should have the coaching effect. Um, our, I've done two TED talks. One's called "Why Comfort Will Ruin Your Life." Uh, which a lot of athletic teams have put a model of growth from that talk in, into, into play. And the last one is, was a very uh, sports-centric. It's called A New Way to Win. Uh, it was about uh, coaching to the student-athlete experience. Our website is excelsports.com, E-C-S-E-L-L, sports.com. So, um, and I'm all over social media. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, all the, all the places I suppose I should be. And if anybody wants to connect or visit, I always, I love to, when people reach out, I always respond. I got another, one last question. Um, your Ted talk, why comfort will kill us. Um, <laughs> I will ruin your life while well, comfort will ruin your life. That's our whole me message. That's our whole ethos. I mean, that's the, we go back 2,500 years. That's what the Spartans um, believed. And so give me one or two sentences, if you don't mind, while we wrap up here. Why will comfort ruin your life? Because growth only occurs in a state of discomfort. Um, and, it, and that is not just a, a catchy slogan. It is legitimate. We have applied it biologically, psychologically, physiologically. It, it applies. Uh, when you lift weights, you tear muscle fiber, right? You're creating discomfort. It heals stronger. Um, mentally, when you're challenged, what happens? It expands your comfort zone. You do, you, you're able to do better things. You do drills and conditioning to build stamina. You know, you can't become more fit aerobically without being stretched aerobically. Um, you, it applies to everything in our lives. And, and that is so important. And, but for people to be able to consciously recognize when they're in the state of discomfort um, is hard to do for getting people to say to intellectually understand the concepts and that's why i think my ted talk that first ted talk has done so well it's got close to five million views is people listen to it and we we put a model together and the model makes sense and people can intellectualize it um, and if i can't intellectualize it, i probably won't do it so it gives a lot of people opportunity to understand the importance of, yeah, of the Spartan way, right? Growth through discomfort. 
Maximize energy, optimize nutrition, and improve performance with Wild Health. Personalized precision health care built for Spartans. You'll get a personalized health plan based on your DNA and biometrics and the support of a team of health experts. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Up Podcast.